I'm thankful to have a good, good father. I have a good earthly father and I have a good heavenly father. I think preaching uh, Mother's Day is harder than preaching Father's Day because it's easy for most people, if you're, for everybody that's a Christian, to see the good father, whether you had a good earthly father or not. But it reminds me, I, my, I still have my father here and I've lost my, my grandfather, but it reminds me of the example that they set to direct us towards our heavenly father. I don't know how many people in my life have directed me towards the word, but my, my grandfather and father were saved later in life compared to most people when you talk to them, if they've been in church their lives, they get saved when they're a little kid. My grandpa was in his 50s or 60s and my, my father was 40 when he got saved. But it reminds me still of the example that, that they set for me. So the last four weeks, we've been talking about the five P's of evangelism. I'm going to wrap that up this morning. Um, the fifth one here, and we're going to be talking about the power uh, that is part of evangelism. So again, Acts chapter 9, starting verse 32, if you would stand in honor of reading God's word. Acts 9 and 32. <clears throat> As Peter was traveling from place to place, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Ananias who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. So all who lived in Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, again, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, God. We thank you that we can come into your presence, God. We thank you that you've designed us not to just live this life, but to thrive, God. And, and God, that, that you are a, a good father. And God, I just thank you for that. I thank you for your love and compassion for each and every one of us, God, no matter our background, no matter where we came from, the things that we do, the mistakes that we've made. You forgive us and you've given us the grace and the ability to move into our lives and to grow closer to you. And God, I just thank you for that. I just ask now that our hearts and our minds would be clear of the problems and the things going on around us, God, and that we would just focus on you for just this short time. And God, we would see how powerful you truly are this morning. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, and amen. And if somebody wants to tell me how I pronounce those later, that's fine too, because I thought I had those down until I got up here this morning. But... I was reading some quotes this week and talking about evangelism, and I, I wanted to, to share a few with you. That I'm going to start with one and then end with a couple. Um, but Ed Stetzer, he's, he's, he's many people, he writes many books, everybody, many people have heard of him. He said this, though, many Christians love evangelism as long as someone else is doing it. If that doesn't hit you in the face, <laughs> maybe we should think about that for a minute. Many Christians love evangelism as long as someone else is doing it now church i want you to think for a minute we we go into our workplace or whatever and some days it'd be nice if somebody would help us out right maybe do our work for us but when it comes to evangelism nobody is going to evangelize the people that you interact with except for you when you go to your job i don't care if you work with one person you work with thousands of people you're the only one that can you can depend on to share the gospel with that person that's next to you and there's many ways to share the gospel we've talked about that Throughout the last few weeks, I think throughout most of this year, we've talked about how to share the gospel. You're probably tired of hearing about it. I'm going to keep preaching it. There are many ways to tell people about the God who loves them. It doesn't matter what's happened in their life. It doesn't matter the things that people have said about them. They have a God that loves them because he created them in his image, period. And I've had people argue with me before. We have some people at work that they, I've talked about it before, they're atheists, they're agnostic, whatever it is, right? And they will argue with you at times and say, well, is God's word really God's word when men wrote it? Well, God inspired it. So yeah, it's God's word. Okay, that's all I got for you. I don't, I don't know how to sugarcoat that anymore. But it's funny to me how people can say, well, how can a God love me that I don't really know? He created you in the womb. He didn't just create you on this earth. He created you in the womb because the Bible speaks very clearly in Jeremiah. I made you and I formed you in the womb. I knew you before birth. I knew all the things about you. And it was plan A that Jesus would come and walk this earth and die in our place. 
In Genesis 1, when, when man was created, and in Genesis 3, when man f- failed, the plan hadn't changed. The plan hadn't changed at all because God knew that without a doubt, somebody was going to fall short of his glory and fall into the trap of Satan. We serve a God who has not changed, right? But I'm going to tell you, we have a Satan in this world that has changed and is conniving. We were talking about it during Sunday school. Me and Marty were having a conversation. It's amazing how we think, well, God's the same, so we don't have to change. Satan has changed his game, and if we don't change ours, the church is going to continue to fall flat on its face. Not just Ellis Mound, but other churches. So this morning, I'm going to bring to an end this series um, another call to action to share the gospel. I know everybody's ready for me to shut up about it. But we've been through this series and talked for four weeks about the importance and, of, of, of prayer and the importance of being present in people's lives and all these different things. But they truly do not matter without this week. If we don't have the power that God's giving us, we cannot evangelize people. You and I cannot save a person. I I can point them to Jesus, but I can't save that person, right? Only the power of God can save that person. So as we've talked about talking with God and speaking about him with others, again, without the power of God himself, we cannot evangelize people. You didn't get saved because you walked an aisle. You you didn't get saved because you knelt in prayer. You got saved because of what you prayed and who you prayed to. You you can walk this aisle week in and week out, but it doesn't mean you're a Christian. It doesn't mean you've been born again. Only when you tell God, God, I've fallen short of your glory. I need your grace. Will you be saved? That's the only way. So as we look through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and, and you will see the many coming to Jesus, right? As Jesus died, there wasn't a whole lot of followers that were the way, right? If you really look at Scripture, there was only about 120 people that were really in the way. But when you look at the impact that God had, Jesus himself, when he walked this earth, he interacted with thousands and thousands of people, right? We really can dive in and say, well, he he really did save people. Yeah, he did. But were they really following him in the end is the difference, right? You can get saved and not be following Jesus where you need to be. You can get saved and say, well, God, I don't really think that's the direction I need to go. I'm going to go this way. But it doesn't mean you're doing the right things in life, right? But many coming to find out who he was, to find out what he was all about, it wasn't due to anything except the power of Jesus. I want you to think people didn't start coming to Jesus until miracles really started happening, right? He he called the, the, the disciples, but miracles really hadn't happened when the disciples were called. They were starting to, right? But as people saw what Jesus truly could do, and they just wanted to touch him, they just wanted to be in his presence, and they believed that they would be healed of whatever problems they were going through. It wasn't due to how he looked, I can tell you that much right now. Jesus looked ordinary. He didn't stand out among the crowd, right? It's not like when an American goes to like China, and they see a blonde-haired, blue-eyed person, and they're like, that person doesn't belong here, right? Jesus didn't look like that. He looked the same as everybody else. He didn't look extraordinary. So as we see in the verses this morning, two cities turned to Christ because of one display of God's power. One display of God's power saved many in two different cities. And the city of Lydia, Lydda sorry, was a regional town. I was studying this week. And it was an important trade city. I want you to think in our country today, the big cities, we would think of New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, all these big towns, you know what's not happening there? The spread of the gospel. It's not happening in these big cities. Why? Because everything, they have everything and anything they want to do. Whatever feels good, go and do it. Right? There's nothing wrong with those cities, but that's the reality of when, those, when people are there, there's opportunity to do whatever you want. And I think we as Christians have said, well, I don't want to go into the big city. I don't, I don't want to be ridiculed and, and something happened when I go there. Peter wasn't looking for a healing. I don't, I don't believe Peter was just going to this town to heal. The, he was just passing through. As you look at Scripture, as he was traveling place to place, he came to a town where he found a man who was paralyzed. Yeah, he was looking to serve God. I believe that with all my heart. But he was just passing through this town, right? He was going to spread the gospel. But I don't believe that he was looking to save a paralyzed person. I believe God intervened and put him there in that time. So one man who'd been lame, I'm going to get to my point, I'm sorry, (laughs) was healed not by Peter, 
Not by the words that were spoken, but by a gospel that we still have today. If you look at any point in Scripture, the miracle that happened was not because of the person that was there, but because of the power of the God that put them there. I want you to think about Moses for a minute. Moses had a stuttering problem. Moses was not eloquent in speaking. Yet when he went to Pharaoh, one of the strongest power leaders in, in, the, in the time of ancient Israel, and they were in the control of the Egyptians, we don't see anywhere where he stuttered. We don't see anywhere where he struggled with Pharaoh. We see he had to go back to Pharaoh over and over again. But I can tell you right now he didn't struggle because God had his back. I, I can only imagine how frustrated he probably was when he came off the mountain after getting the Ten Commandments. And literally the Bible says that he threw them and he broke them because of the sin that Israel was doing when he was up on the mountain in the presence of God. I, I know for myself this week, we had our prayer walk Friday night for church camp that's coming up that I'm preaching this, this week, and uh, it's amazing how God ha, has, has worked this week, but it's also amazing how Satan has tried to stop that work. I've been trying to get my sermons ready, and I'm not, I'm not ready, okay? I'm just a few days away, and I've got one sermon ready for a whole week of preaching, okay? But things have happened this week, and Emily had some stuff at work, and my truck started acting up and just this and that. And there's things that are going on and Satan is really trying to stop. That's the Satan that's in this world today. We start serving God. We start getting where we need to get. People are going to say, well, God didn't really do that. It just happened. That, that man really wasn't healed. It just, it just happened. So we need to take heed to the gospel. This is just my opinion, but I believe, and I have to write my own opinion down. This is sad. I believe with all my heart that people today will respond the same way they did when Jesus walked this earth. I, I truly believe that people respond the same way G when Jesus walked if we would just let ourselves be hungry for God enough to share it with the next person. The, the world is hungry for something. It, it's, it's whatever it is, it's not a good thing, right? But they are hungry for something different. Ever seen a child, they start acting up, you know what they're doing? Generally, they want attention, right? A child doesn't care if they get good attention or bad attention, they want attention. And sometimes when a child starts acting out, it's because we've neglected to an extent, because we had other things going on, whether we realize it or not. The world is very much the same way. They want attention. Christian, we've got to give them the right attention, though. As we go through the month of, of June, and I've said it once and I'll say it again, it's Gay Pride Month, and I don't like what that community has done with the flag and all the things and the rainbow that it really represented for us, right, as Christians, that God was never going to do that again and that he, he had grace upon us. Those people still need Jesus. Those people still need the Word of God in their lives, and they are hungry for attention. These people that have caused these Mass shootings, and as bad as they are, those people want attention. They don't care if it's good or bad. They just want attention. Something's gone on in their life. So the first thing I really want us to see, and I've got my three as normal, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. But the op opportunity is there if we are seeking God daily. If you're not looking to God daily, you're not going to just travel to, from place to place as Peter was. You're not just going to go, I'm going down to this city because I know there's an opportunity there, right? If you're not really in the Word of God, you're not doing those things. You're not looking for God to lead you in your walk and where you're going. Sometimes at, at work, and, and uh, my coworkers would tell you, I like to talk. Okay, It's just how I am. I don't really care. But sometimes to take the opportunity, Tony's laughing at me back there in the corner, <laughs> we, to take the opportunity to take out of your day to just talk to somebody. You know, I, we've, we've had some coworkers that have gone through a lot of things. They've been out of the building for a while, whatever it is. And they come back and they just, to have a conversation with them. And not go, well, I need this done. No, no. How are you? Are you doing okay? It's like we've talked about being present in people's lives. If we're really looking for the opportunity to serve God, we're going to get to serve God. Period. If we're not looking, though, for an opportunity to serve God, I'm going to tell you right now, you're missing them every single day. Whether it's, carry your books in my way, uh, whether it's with your, 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 your spouse or it's with your kids or your grandkids, you are missing the opportunity that's right in front of you if you're not seeking God daily. And you, only you can tell what you're doing in your home life. Are you praying like you should be with your spouse? 
I know me and Emily, we used to, before we had Annabelle, we prayed really well at dinner time, especially. Now it's God is good, God is great, let us thank you for our food. Amen. Because that's all Annabelle's got time for, apparently. And I- anymore, we have to do it twice because she picks her spoon up halfway through. It's like, nope, we're starting over. We'll do this over again. But if we are looking for the opportunity, God's going to give us the opportunity. But if you're saying, God, I really don't want that opportunity, you're, you're not going to get it because you're going to miss it because you're fearful of what's going to happen next. I went drag racing last night with my uncle, and for those that don't know, if you take off and it's a red light, you lose. Okay, I'm just going to start off with a story with that. And uh, we went up there the second round to, to run, and he was racing somebody he knew, and he's like, he always cuts a good light. I've got to, I've got to cut a good light. I've got to get a green light. It's got to be close. And I looked at him and said, don't make it too close. Okay, we don't want a 499 red and you lose. Okay, five's perfect. So he, he improved his light. So what did we do the next time? We red lighted. The next round, we weren't worried about cutting the light. We red lighted. So we get so caught up in that one thing, right, that we're not worried about the next step. Because anything can happen. You get off the line and go sideways into the wall. Okay, we got bigger problems than if I cut a red light or a green light. But we get so caught up in that one thing. And if we screw it up, we feel like, oh, we're done. I failed. I'm not going to do it again. If you didn't read your word, yes, the word of God yesterday, try to read it today. Okay, don't beat yourself up and say, well, I didn't do very good yesterday. You're not going to do good every day, okay? You're not going to seek God the way you need to every single day. But Peter was looking for ways for God to work through him and in his life while he walked this earth. This is the same Peter who denied him three times. This is the same Peter who had a big mouth that didn't think before he spoke. And now he's serving God because he's allowed God everything that he is. That's the power of God, that God can change a person to be usable for his glory and his glory only. The saying is very true in life. God qualifies the called. He doesn't always use the qualified. That that, that is very true in life today. I know many more pastors that are unqualified by what the world standard would be. They don't have a degree. They didn't go to school to get a piece of paper, okay? But they've served God daily. And you would think of a few. The first one that comes to my mind is Richard McCormick. Richard McCormick is not a, a, he doesn't have all the knowledge in the world because he went to school. He's got all the knowledge because he was in the Word. (laughs) Because he's been doing it for almost 60 years of his life. He's been preaching the gospel of Jesus. The second thing is we need boldness. Not only do we need to look for opportunities, but we need to be bold when God gives us that opportunity. The only way the power of God can be shown to the world is through you and through me. They don't see God because they're not looking for him. But you can be a light in the world that you're, you're in. We, we talk about it all the time in, in different places. And I may not be able to change the whole world, okay? Trust me, I'm not changing the whole world, okay? It's not going to happen. But I can change the world that I live in. I, I can change the, the people that are around me. I, I can be there and be present in their lives by seeking God and being bold. So we need to be bold that the God we live for, okay, because he will save anyone. And everyone where they are. That's the, the power that we need to tell people is you don't have to clean yourself up first. You don't have to go, well, God, I, I'm just not where I need to be. No, you go to God and let God clean you up. Church, we as Christians, we need cleaned up sometimes. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, even as Christians today. So I'm going to tell you, each and every one of us have missed an opportunity to share the, the gospel of Jesus. Whether we want to, like I said, whether we want to admit it or not, we've all missed an opportunity to serve Jesus in some form or fashion. And you may say, well, I haven't. I'm going to call shenanigans, okay? I might call you a liar even. Why? Because none of us are perfect. Peter fell short of God at some point or another. I don't think that he fell short one time. I think he fell short several times as we read through Scripture. But he still prayed for a boldness that God would use him to glorify himself. Not to glorify Peter, but to glorify God himself. So we need to be, a, to be bold to tell the world no matter what they throw at us that Jesus is still in charge. The goodness of God is still true even if we're in the deepest valley of life. The boldness that we need is to remind ourselves that God is still in control. Satan may be winning but I want to tell you in the end I've read the end of the book. Okay? I don't know if everybody's read through Revelation. I've read the end. I know what happens. Jesus is coming back. And whether we're prepared or not, he's coming. 
So I would suggest that we get started now. And I put this in my notes to remind not just you but me. And I put, Christian, listen to me, and I want you to catch this. You will be persecuted for believing in Jesus. It is going to happen in your life that you are going to be put down because of Jesus. You're, you're going to be talked about because your love for Jesus is different than what the world thinks it should be. They're, they're going to put you down because you go to work with a smile every day. Okay, I've been in a job before when I worked at John Deere that I had a guy ask me, how do you come with a smile every day? Because I got to get up this morning, I, I have a job, I may not enjoy it, like it's pouring down rain, I get to go count equipment. Oh, thank you, just what I want to do today. But if you put a smile on your face, people are watching. They see that. They know if you're having a good day or a bad day. And trust me, they're going to let you know <laughs> one way or the other most days. If you're not persecuted today, it will, it will happen. When you start serving God, I'm a true believer in this. When you start serving God, Satan starts working more in you. Satan starts putting the roadblocks in the way to get you to stop. And Christian, we've got to be bold enough to say, I'm not going to stop no matter what you put in my way. No matter what happens, I'm going to continue to work for God. The third thing, the final thing, we need the faith. <laughs> Peter went to this man who had been paralyzed and been bedridden for eight years. I don't think Peter knew all this information when he went up to the guy, I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't think he knew all that until he started asking questions later. But what did he say to him? He said, I heal you, get up. No, he said, Jesus Christ heals you, get up and make your bed. Peter went believing that the God that he served in Jesus could do this work. He believed that Jesus could heal him in Jesus alone. I think of the, the lame man that his four buddies lowered him through the roof right to Jesus. They had the faith that if they put him right next to Jesus... He's going to get up and he's going to walk out of there. I, I believe that or they wouldn't have done the work that they did to get him down to Jesus. We get so caught up in, well, I didn't do that right. Well, guess what? The disciples didn't even do it right. Get out of here. I'll throw that thing. What's wrong with you, Carrie? Sabotage. We get so caught up, though, and the disciples had the answers. No, they didn't. The disciples were a bunch of hodgepodge misfits, to say the least. But God changed them. So when people are healed, we should believe without a doubt that Jesus is the one who did it. We've been praying for, for Jackson for several weeks now and, and a couple months even that he would be, be healed. For those that don't know, Jackson was born with half a heart. I mean, Jackson, he has half a heart. And now he's been through this trauma the last couple months and now they're saying he needs a transplant. He's going to need a transplant. And, and I, I'm looking Facebook yesterday and uh, Facebook is terrible sometimes, okay? But I got on there, and four minutes before I'd got on there, Rick had posted that Jackson had basically went into cardiac arrest to an extent, and they had to, he didn't say all that. He just said, hey, we just need prayer. And I can only imagine how people stopped and prayed. And he posted an update later that things were back to where they were. I would say it was improvement, but it was improvement from where they were at the time. But when Jackson gets healed, and I'm believing without a doubt that it's going to happen, it's not because a doctor did it. It's because God did it through that doctor, through the people who are on that staff. Whatever the, the problem might be, the only physician that we have to trust in is Jesus, right? Yeah, the doctor may be the one cutting on us, but Jesus is the one that's going to make us well or not. And if he doesn't, he's going to make us well in eternity, right? I think I said at the beginning of service, whether you heal him now or you heal him in eternity, it's going to happen. That's the God that we serve. But we have to have the faith that when the Bible says that this man immediately got up, that he immediately got up, picked up his mat, and he walked for the first time in eight years. That's the God that we serve. And if we don't start evangelizing people in this world, he's not going to grow. He's going to start dwindling because we aren't shining the light for God. God hasn't changed. But if you really look at the history of the world Every time there's been more than one opportunity in life that it felt like God was coming back. Oh, he could come back today, right? But I believe without a doubt that every time that happened, there was a great awakening in our world. There was a chance that people started turning to God. And if there's one time that we need it, it's right now. Our country alone needs revival, let alone the rest of the world. Our country needs to, to get a grip of itself and turn back to what really matters in life. 
The decisions that are made, what, whatever they are, they should be made because God said, hey, I, I, you need to do this. The Bible speaks very clearly that we're to pray for the leaders of our country. Whether we like them or not, we're to pray for our leaders. I pray every day that they would get to, to Jesus. Well, they're, they're this or they're that. I, I don't care. They really don't know Jesus some days. Some of them said, don't care what side of the spectrum you're on. They're both got their problems. But until we as a country put God first, we quit taking the Ten Commandments out of places, and we start saying, Jesus is Lord, nothing's going to happen. So church, if you truly want to grow, okay, if we really want to see growth for the kingdom of God, we've got to get out of the way and let God speak through us and help us to evangelize other people. Christian, this morning, we are weak in evangelism. Every single one of us is weak in evangelism. Why? Because we quit looking for the power of God in our life. Well, I, things are good right now. I don't need God. No, I need God more in the good times than I do in the bad times. I, I need God in the good times because I need protection from what Satan's going to be doing next. I've got two quotes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close. One of the great evangelists, Luis Palau, he, he passed just a little while back. And he said this, evangelism is not an option for the Christian life. Evangelism is not an option for the Christian life. No, not everybody's going to be called to be a, a preacher in front of the church. But each and every one of us should be preaching the gospel through our life. We, we should be living and walking and talking about Jesus every chance that we get. And Albert Moeller of Southern Seminary, he said, he said this, and if this hurts your feelings, then you're with me, okay? At the end of the day, the bi biggest obstacle to evangelisms, evangelism sorry, is Christians who don't share the gospel. The biggest obstacle to evangelism is Christians who don't share the gospel. Well, I read that this week, it hit me right in the face. It hit me right in the face and I was like, oh, okay. I needed that. Why? Because I have my days, right? I try to live what I preach when I come to, to church, when I go out in the world. I try to live a life that people see Jesus, but it doesn't happen every day. Sometimes you have a bad night. You get two or three hours of sleep because your kid was up or you were out late having fun doing drag racing and talking and just being goofy, right? But guess what? God should still be first in our lives. I don't care what priorities you think you've got, God should be number one. And until he's number one, this evangelism will not happen. Until God is number one in our lives, it's not going to change for the glory of God. The church is not going to start growing until we, as the church, quit thinking, well, what can I do for me? And how can I serve others? And how can I serve Jesus? I'm going to ask Carrie and Sheila to come. I'm going to ask that you stand this morning. Give them a second to get up here, try not to break anything. But when I think of the biggest obstacle to evangelism, the people who are doing it are not perfect. Nobody in this room is a perfect vessel for God. But God created you for a point in time. He created you to be a vessel for Him, whether you feel like you're worthy or not. If He didn't want to use you, He wouldn't. But He wants to use you. He wants to speak into your life if you would just let Him this morning. Heavenly Father God, as we just come to you at this time, of invitation, God. I just ask that your work would be done in our hearts. God, I ask that we would see your power. God, you're a God. You're the only one who is willing to send your son to die on a cross. You're the only one that has grace and love for us that outweighs every sin that we could ever do against you and your word, God. God, I am thankful that when you save us, that you throw our sin as far as the east is from the west away. God, I'm thankful that you just throw it and you never look at it again. And God, I ask that each and every one of us here would realize that you are powerful. Your word is powerful. In the good times, in the bad times, God, the times that we just feel like it's impossible, you are powerful enough because you've conquered the grave. You've already conquered hell, God. And I think that the song that we sing sometime ain't no grave. God, you went down to hell and you took back every key and you saved our souls, God. God, in this time of invitation, I ask that your will would be done in our hearts. God, in the life of this church, 
God, I ask that you would break us for the things that break your heart, God. Break us to see how desperately this world needs you. And God, I ask that you would help us to be a vessel. God, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you, I ask that you would just lay it on their heart, that you died for them on a cross, God, so that they wouldn't have to endure hell and that they would be able to spend eternity with you. God, if there is one here this morning, I just pray that you would work in their heart and that today would be the day of salvation. Uh, Maybe it's church membership, God, or or baptism, God. I I ask that we would just be obedient in what you're calling us to do. And God, I ask that during this time of invitation that we would just be receptive to you. And God, I ask that you would just work in our hearts. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, and amen.